Welcome everyone to the Tulsa.net user group. Tonight, Scott Anselman here to uh, talk with us about several things about how to be a, a productive uh, uh, developer using a lot of great tools that he's been uh, uh, using and blogging about for quite some time now. So uh, Scott, it's great to uh, it was great to meet you at Build. I've, I've been looking forward to to doing that. And um, it was great that uh, you're able to to be here and speak to the group. I greatly appreciate it. I know we all do. So I'll let you uh, take it from here. Brilliant, brilliant. Appreciate that. Cool, can you see my screen okay? Yes. All right, good deal. So um, we're in an interesting place right now. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. Uh, I hope some of the folks may have seen uh, some of the talks that I did at Build recently. Uh, one of them was called Developer Joy at Build. That was actually a pretty good talk. It was called Developer Joy with Hansman and Friends. And we had uh, Kayla Cinnamon on. If you don't know who Kayla is, she is the program manager for the Windows Terminal and is now doing uh, program management for a new tool that is called uh, Developer Home. And Developer Home is open source and it's still trying to figure out what it wants to be, but it's got some pretty cool features. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm not trying to sell you on this thing, but I am showing you one of the things that I'm working on and how it all fits together. Because what I wanna remind folks of what we did is if we go over to the Twitter, which is a dumpster fire right now, and I think it was, a, a tweet on developer mode. So I proposed in August of 2018, developer mode. And I made a list of the things I want. So that's about five years ago or a half decade as my children call it. And then after that, if I recall, there it is. We made a checklist in 2019. And this is kind of cool. Some of the things that we shipped that you all don't know that we shipped is we shipped uh, an improvement in the indexer in Windows. So it knows if it's indexing a Git repo and it doesn't go in, into the .git folder and do all kinds of dumb things. We also don't index uh, source code. We just index the metadata, which makes that faster. Big changes happening in virus scanning, including a thing called asynchronous defender. Because if you're actively compiling code, you will uh, end up, scanning for the viruses that you're probably writing, or at least that's Windows's perspective. But of course, you're a developer and you know that you're not writing a virus. Um, so it would not scan until later, which is cool. Uh, there's going to be improvements in virtual desktop and window management around things like fancy zones. And we added WinGet. So this is not to say I predicted those things, but if I'm speaking as like, you've got a friend in the diamond business, it's a guy locally here in Portland who is on the radio and he's always talking about how it's nice to have a friend in the diamond business. I try to be your friend at Microsoft. So by making this list, I'm validating with the community and then I'm taking it up to the people uh, to make sure that this is something that you all want, right? So uh, we are doing those things. And the things that we have done so far are WSL, which I hope everyone is using. Is everyone familiar with WSL and using it daily and loving it? Some nods, some baubles. Uh, then terminal. If you're still using the old terminal, we're going to get you off that because you're uh, you got to get on board. And then WinGet. And I would say amongst these three things, the three uh, you know legs of the stool, WinGet is the one I think gets the least amount of like respect. So I want to I do want to sell you a little bit on that because there's some pretty cool stuff going on around uh, WinGet that maybe you haven't seen. Specifically, WinGet configure, which is the hotness. And I build a lot of machines because I'm, I'm doing what's called dog fooding. So I have to rebuild machines from daily builds of Windows. And uh, I used to make a, uh, a batch file basically that was like win, get, install, whatever. And it was just like line after line after line after line after line, right? So that's probably what a lot of you are doing. Is that a fair statement? A lot of win, get, install type action. The way that you win, get, install, is you usually go win, get search, and you search for something, and then you find it, and then you say, I want that, and then you right click, and then you say win, get install, and then you hit enter. So now it's gonna go and install that thing. And it's thinking, and then it'll be done in a second, and then I'll have Midnight Commander installed, which will look like this. which is like file manager for old people. It might used to be called Norton Commander, but Midnight Commander is actually a, a tool that was written by um, 
Miguel de Acasa, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Okay, so Winget configure though is a little bit more interesting. And Winget configure is desired state configuration that is usually used within the context of a repository. So if we go over to ASP.NET Core, and I want to point out how you see I you see me moving around in the in the uh, PowerShell right here. By the way, my blood sugar is a little high. I had a cookie earlier. That's my blood sugar. It's live, and we'll see it changing in the uh, in the prompt there. Uh, I've got a REST API for my 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 blood sugar, uh, and I have that next to the current Git branch. How many modified? files that I've got, and then the version of .NET that is live and active in the current folder. So if I hit Z, I have this F7 pop-up here that's letting me move around from place to place. And you can see how as I move around here, now I'm in this folder. And this is .NET 7, this is .NET 8. I can also hit F7, and I can get this. I'm showing you that because you know, if you've ever seen me talk before, that I'm kind of obsessive about not wasting keystrokes and moving around efficiently. And I think it would be less fun and less entertaining if me at the command line involves me doing this. All right, we're going to go to my GitHub now. Right, that's kind of obnoxious. So I want you to be able to move around as fast as I can. And I also want you to uh, enjoy yourself when you're doing it. And then when you go, it should be pretty and it should have bright colors and cool icons for all of your stuff. And you can go and Google with Bing and find all of these things on my uh, on my blog. So I've got terminal icons. I've got oh my posh. I've got my blood sugar. I've got zoomy stuff, and uh, I've also filled up my um, my terminal with all the cool stuff. And you can see that I've got PowerShell, which is my default, and then Ubuntu here. And then on my on my other machine, the one I used at build, I've got probably fifteen more profiles, and I've added Git shell and Anaconda and other stuff as well. Another thing about Windows Terminal that people don't use enough of is Shift Windows P, which is the same kind of um, command palette, they call it, that you would get if you're using uh, Visual Studio Code. So then if you want to do something and you don't know how to do it, then um, you can say Shift Windows P and you see how it says close pane right there? You can actually see that I've bound it to control W. So I've gone and made control T and control W, which are open tab and close window or close tab, the same in my browser as I have in my terminal. And that's very kind of organic and natural. So I can just hit control T and control T and then control W to close a pane, which is really nice, I think. Yeah, so uh, Steve points out splitting tabs. I'm gonna hold down alt with my left thumb while clicking on Ubuntu. And now I've got Ubuntu on the right and Windows on the left. And I can go and split those tabs as many times as I want. And then I can hit Control W, Control W to bring those back, which is really hot. Isn't that nice? Uh, Brian says, can you win get oh my posh? You absolutely can. You can say win get search posh. I want to point out something. I said win get search. I'm going to actually hit O O H and hit tab. It actually spins through stuff. So it's actually calling win get and running through the list of stuff that has the word get in it. Now it's not really useful for these numbers because these are store numbers and I've added MS store, but you can see I'm hitting shift tab and tab to go and do that stuff, which is cool. So I've actually um, hit Winget and I can hit tab and I can run through the actual commands. Now, how do you do that? I'm gonna type code dollar sign profile, bring up my profile here in Visual Studio Code. You can see all my posh is right here, which is printing out that prompt. And then we've got these argument completers, okay? And argument completers are a thing that's built into uh, PowerShell. And you can see an argument completer for winget right there. So winget, when you type winget something and hit tab, what it's actually doing is it's calling winget complete with the partial word that you typed. You see? And then the position of the cursor. And then the list that gets returned is a for loop 
list a for each over a completion result. So what you can do is then do the same thing for .NET. .NET has a completer as well. See how it says .NET complete? You follow me? I've got all of this in my blog. So I can type .NET B and hit tab and it makes .NET build, which is cool. But what is the hotkey for building in, uh, uh, in Visual Studio, friends? F5. That's running. Oh, control shift B. There you go, control shift B. So I actually bound control shift B to type .NET build and press enter because I couldn't get control shift B out of my hands. So I just said, I'm not gonna fight it anymore. Uh, and instead I'm gonna put in a, a uh, this. Isn't that cool? All of this on my blog and on my GitHub. So you can go and pick the stuff that makes you uh, happy. Now I'm going to back up in the chat because I love seeing the reactions. Jeremy, what do you? How did you? Know, what did you not know? You said, "How did I not know this?" In all caps. Which thing did you not know, Jeremy? I did not know about the .NET complete command. Yeah, yeah, we got that too. Let's go and see if we if we if we have that Hanselman uh, .NET complete. Oh, so I would encourage you to put the word Hanselman in all of your Google searches, Jeremy. You can do this that. This is exactly what I say. Is that what you want to do? Somehow you have Make everything. that happen for me? Yeah. Winget.net and Git. And I have details on how to do that. Okay. And just because I'm that guy, I blogged 20 minutes ago for the first time in six months. So little thing on how to do Let's Encrypt in WSL. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, cool. So what the hell was I talking about? Winget. So I'm going to go over to ASP.NET Core. Now, this is the actual source code for ASP.NET proper. This is a big pile of source. And what's interesting about this source code is if we go over to ASP.NET Core on GitHub and we go and take a look at it, we can see the build from source instructions. It's a lot. It says you got to go and clone, you got to do your submodules, and you got to go and install Visual Studio. And they made a PowerShell script for it. and when you do that, you got to go and run this and you got to, and it's a whole thing. So I talked a little bit about this at Build, which is the, hey, welcome to the company. We're happy to have you here. Here's a Word document. Go figure out what you need to do to build the software. And then we'll see you next week when you get product, pr productive. So what we did is I made this ASP.NET Core desired state configuration, and I apologize, dot .yaml. Uh, uh, YAML is basically XML for young people. Uh, it's, uh, which is similar to, which is, uh, XML is basically like JSON, right? But JSON is it for like middle-aged people. So it depends on whether you want a curly brace, an angle bracket, or just white space. And the great thing about YAML is that, uh, you have absolutely no idea what anything does or how it looks, and they have no validation or any way to tell if it's going to be okay until it fails. So... White space matters. These are all spaces, no tabs allowed, and you have to count them. So it's really your worst nightmare. There's just nothing good about anything that YAML provides, uh, and it sucks, and I would encourage you to avoid it at all costs. Uh, yeah, and actually, I think I had a tweet about that at some point because I have strong feelings about YAML because XML was fine, and everyone disagrees with me, but that's fine. I'm not bitter. Yeah, that was my my tweet. However, you also use Mastodon, which is far more important these days. I use Mastodon. I use Blue Sky. I am non-denominational. I go to all the churches because I want to make sure when I get there, I'm in the right heaven. So I don't know which social network is going to get me there. So I'll just join them all, right? I'm also on Snap because my kids say that'll get me to heaven. So we'll see. Okay. So Barring the fact that this is YAML and YAML sucks, let's go ahead and skip out of there and let's look at it in something that'll look halfway decent. We'll do it in Visual Studio Code. This is a desired state configuration that will set you up so that you can build the ASP.NET repository. So what you got here is a resource, a desired state configuration resource, which is a, a plugin basically. And that plugin knows how to do WinGet stuff. 
And then here's the settings for it, which is use WinGet, and that's the ID that you're gonna go and use, right? And then these are all WinGet packages, WinGet packages. Now here's where it gets cool. We use WinGet to install Visual Studio Community. Okay, I'm pausing for effect. Then we switch to a different DSC from a different provider, not Microsoft WinGet desired state configuration, but VS Components. And I love this, this is freaking amazing. What this does is it depends on this package. So it makes sure that it won't run until VS is installed. And then it loads this VS config file. VS config file is a thing that's been around for years that nobody knows about. Okay, what's a VS config file? VS config file is a list of all the obscure checkboxes in Visual Studio that you need under optional stuff. So if you open up Visual Studio installer right now and you go modify, and then you click individual components and then you go, ah, cause it sucks. You have to go in here and get specific obscure bits for the thing that you want. And usually you read all of that stuff from a markdown file and it's a nightmare. These aren't just the clicky clicky workload stuff. It's not the, I want node, I want ASP.NET. It's the specific packs and build tools that you need. So what you do is you put all of that into a VS config file. And that VS config file can then be passed into the installer, that Visual Studio installer that we just saw. And there's two ways to do it. You get your VS exactly the way you want it. And then you can say import configuration or export configuration. Jeremy, did you know this? Damn it. All yep, right. that's I'll one try, thing. I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get to a place where I can show you something you don't know. So I'll try harder. So far you've done good. <laughs> All right, well, you already, but if you already knew about VS Config, does anyone here not know about VS Config or am I the last person to learn about it? Give me something. Okay, you're all learning good stuff. All right. So the point here is that you get your VS config the way you want it. You export the configuration, and then you can take you get this file here. Now, this file pro tip can be embedded instead of VS config file. Now I don't know how to do it because YAML sucks, but basically you remove all of the spaces or you remove everything that's meaningful in the quotes and everything, and you can put it like this. So you can embed it into the the, the DSC. YAML file. Hang on. Are you leaving? My son got his first job as a dishwasher and he's going right now. Give me one second. Okay. Tell me I'm not the only one that might be lazy enough to just go from YAML to, uh, to JSON, edit it in JSON, and then convert it back to YAML just so that I don't have to deal with spaces. There are converters online. My, uh, my 17 year old, uh, was sitting around the house and he's not doing anything. So we printed out 10 resumes and we went up and down Main Street until he got a job and he got a job on on uh, about resume number eight. So well, by the time we'd gotten off Main Street, they called him back, he did an interview and now he's on the schedule and he's gonna do, he's gonna be a runner and a plater at a restaurant. So he'll plate stuff. So now we're watching the bear on Hulu and now <laughs> he's saying, yes, chef and yelling corner when he comes around. Uh, corners nice. it's pretty it's pretty cool my That's daughter awesome. is a paramedic and just started uh at another ambulance company yesterday nice congratulations yeah thank you so this vs config file here gets sucked in so you can have that file be internal and like embedded as an island or you can have it be external and then what you do is you say win get configure as See, you know, a, a DSC YAML, and then you just say, and this is obnoxious. This is the legal version of uh, dash dash yes or, or dash dash quiet. Uh, so you know, I know how we always joke about how it should be, you know, like dash dash. I really mean it. I'm sure deletes. You know, like it's it's the the lawyers wanted it to be that long. I don't know why. Basically, what you're doing is you're saying yes to a whole ton of stuff that's downstream. So it basically says yes to everything. So you can't just dash dash Y because I don't think that would hold up in court. So they make you do the long version because you're basically saying yes to every every one of these sub things. So what's cool about that? Yeah, exactly, Jeremy. So what's going on here is you 
do a clone and you say Winget configure. So if you're familiar with uh, Linux over the last 20 years, you basically get clone dot slash configure dot slash build. And that's kind of like been the standard. Now that's the standard for a standard, um, you know, Linux C app. So if you're a Linux person, you'll be like, oh, it's configure and build. Yeah, absolutely. Except Windows supports everything, right? So we're trying to do that for everything. So you could have a Python or a Node or a .NET or whatever. This is not .NET specific, but I wanted to show it to you as .NET people because I thought it was cool. I also wanted to point out that to build ASP.NET also requires Java, Yarn, and Node because we do things with JavaScript and uh, minimizing JavaScript in, in, you know, within it. There's a lot going on there, okay? So this is gonna make things a lot easier. And then if we go back over to um, Dev Home, Dev Home is kind of like a hub or a dashboard. It's um, when you say, I'm a developer, you'll get Dev Home by default. Then you can go in here and say, I'm gonna use a configuration file for setup. So you imagine you get a new machine, you log in, you got Dev Home, and then now this is brainstorming. Maybe you log into GitHub, maybe you log into your OneDrive. Where is your Hanselman's DSC file? Is it in a gist? Is it in a OneDrive? Is it in a local folder? You know, you got, we have we have it, we have to think about this because it's open source. So you got a new machine. It says, Oh, yeah, you're a developer. I know you're a developer because you've logged into Visual Studio before. Hey, do you have a DSC file? Yes. Go to lunch. 15 minutes later, you come back, it's got everything set up. So right now you do it manually, but wouldn't it be cool if it did it outside the box? But then you can do this. You can say, hey, I'm gonna set my machine up. I'm gonna clone my repositories. Now this works now, but I wanna also kind of brainstorm what the future looks like. Imagine if you clone the 12 repositories that you need for work. It then does a union of all of the YAML files and then installs all of the stuff that you need. So here I can say add repository from an account or a URL. I'm gonna hit next. And then remember that git, that win get search that I was doing before. So if I say like, look for Git. So that's doing a win get search within the UI of this thing. And then it'll give me a list. I'll probably get maybe return too many things actually. No, probably, probably a mistake. Git fiend, what the hell is Git fiend? Um, yeah, that was probably not a good idea. Um, well, maybe GitHub would be cool. So I could then go and make a manifest and say, all right, I want this this and this, and then make a list of apps and then it'll go and do those as well. So the whole goal here is to get these things set up as fast as you possibly can. So your dev environment would consist of connecting your developer account. GitHub is a plugin. So you could potentially plug in GitLabs or, or Jira tickets or whatever. Set up a dev drive, which is a separate file system uh, with uh, different behavioral characteristics. And then this dashboards thing. Now we all know that widgets suck and there's a huge fight right now about like the widget surface. I want the widget surface to be entirely in, under your control. I don't ever wanna see any of these people uh, on my, um, it's like literally, I'm just like, it's just everyone I don't wanna see except for Indiana Jones is showing up in my list here. Um, I want it to be cool dashboard stuff, right? So this dashboard here is dev home specific and it's a widget host. Now, widgets are plugins, and this widget down here is a widget host. This is the only other current widget host that there is. So what's cool about this is I can go like this. GitHub.com. Maybe I'm the only one that sings when I'm doing this kind of stuff, but anyway. I was surprised you don't have a uh, Stream Deck button that automatically enters that text. Um, I should probably do that. I should actually, it would, it would not be a Stream Deck button. It'd probably be like a, um, uh, what's that thing? Auto Hotkey. It's a uh, great tool for that. This is actually a new machine that I'm on right now. Uh, plus, before I do, and I don't do demos, I delete all this stuff so I can do it over again. But you get the idea, right? So here I could switch between GPUs. I can switch between network controllers and I could basically work on the stuff that I wanna work on. So if I go over here and switch that to large, 
you can imagine where dev home could potentially be. Like I would expect maybe that uh, I could have these widgets live inside of Visual Studio, or I could hit F5 and dev home would change into a debugger type of a session. The potential stuff is, uh, is, is endless. And then with these, men like here I've got mentions. So someone's mentioned me somewhere in here. So I can click on that and it'll send me over directly into um, some mention. I don't know. So apparently I was mentioned like a couple of days ago. Someone's trying to get me to pay attention. So you get the idea, right? Updated this days ago. So then these widgets though appear over here. So they are legit widgets. So you can start putting these widgets into your widget space. So then in some future where they let me right click and make news widgets go away, I could see widgets starting to become really, really useful where I go like this and then I go like that. And then I fill it with cool widgets that I care about and not nonsense. Make sense? Cool. Feel free to interrupt if you have any thoughts or questions, by the way. All right, everyone's everyone's chilling. Blood sugar's going down. Let me check it again here. Good stuff. All right, cool. Um, oh yeah, WSL. I wanted to show you something else that was kind of cool. This is kind of a thing that I did today. So um, I run uh, AzureFriday.com, and um, the guy that helps me, Rob Karen, is actually um, out right now. So um, we're a couple of months behind, even though we have shows, you can find them. They're just not on this website. This website runs an Azure function that scrapes from channel nine and channel nine hasn't updated the Azure Friday shows yet. So you're not going to see them anywhere except in the podcast. But I noticed this morning that it was going to expire and it was, uh, it's going to expire soon. See, like, well, wait a second. That's not, that's like, that's not expiring soon. That's expiring like two weeks ago. How do you how do you um, like refresh this? I want to make sure I'm getting the latest. I feel like I'm on a cached. How do I how do I refresh all my certs, kids? Anyone? No. Bunch of you like operations. Of operations. What? You can try clearing browser cache, but I've not found that effective. Yeah. I have to restart. Clear, clearing browser cache is is like napalm. I want to do this surgically. Shouldn't have to clear browser cache every time I have a concern. Uh, maybe a hard cache and empty and reload. So how come, there it is, empty cache and refresh. Let's try that. That's another thing uh, that maybe y'all didn't know. Once you have F12 tools open, you can right click and you get refresh, refresh, and I mean it, no seriously refresh, which are options that you don't ordinarily get uh, right there. There we go. And you can see that I did it today at noon. All right. How does it have a lock and say it expired? Uh, probably because it uh, was cached and uh, apathy. It probably stopped caring. I don't know, it could be a bug, but you can see that it was just a caching thing. Anyway, it was secure once. Uh, cool. So here's the, here's the thing. Azure Friday has the Azure name in it which makes it risky and Azure won't give me a cert. So when I go and do an app service managed certificate, Azure says, no, I won't, we don't do that because they don't sell certs that have the word Azure in it. Kind of makes sense. Like I was pretty salty about that, but I'm like, yeah, I can see that, right? You don't want to register azuresucks.com or whatever. Um, so I had had a managed cert for many years and then I ended up doing uh, this one here and I ended up... Uh, getting it not, not renewed. And they said, yeah, we don't do Azure anymore. So what I did was I wanted a Let's Encrypt certificate, but Let's Encrypt certificates uh, are a kind of a hassle sometimes. And I wanted to see if I could do it in a fairly easy way. So let me grab my sticky notes, which is probably behind the Zoom window. There it is. I'm just gonna search for my sticky notes, which you can't see. And this is kind of a cool interaction between Windows and, um, and WSL. So here we are in Ubuntu. It is Ubuntu 22.04, so not too old. Also just FYI, it is pronounced Ubuntu. It's not Ubuntu. So don't let people call it that. If they're saying that they're wrong. And uh, I'm gonna go and use a thing called CertBot. 
and CertBot is from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the folks at um, the folks at uh, Let's Encrypt. So here I'm going to go and do a manual update calling Let's Encrypt. And I'm going to say I want both the Apex, what's called the naked domain or the Apex domain, and the wildcard domain. Wildcard domains for SSL are quite expensive. So that's why I do this every three months. Put in my sudo. And then this will say, hey, you already have a certificate. What do you want to do? And you can say renew and replace. No, I'm not going to do that because I literally did it an hour ago and I don't want to get rate limited. But then you run through this process at the command line. And then you end up with a let's encrypt private key over here. Oops. Maybe I need to sudo. There we go. So here's the private key and the full chain for azurefriday.com inside of WSL. Okay, so here's the trick then. Then I go and run OpenSSL and I export it as a PFX, which is a Windows certificate chain. And I stick it into a full chain location. And then this I thought was kind of, uh, of clever. It ends up in a PFX folder, picks up file, and then I copy it over into Windows. Copy it into Windows because I'm copying it out of this world. Now remember, and again, I'm realizing that anything I say, Jeremy's like, I knew that. But if you type explorer.exe and hit dot, I'm in Ubuntu, I can actually run Windows Explorer from WSL. Did anyone not know that? Because I want to feel like I appreciate it in some way. No, no. Robert, Robert's like, oh, I'll give you a pity hand raise. That's fine. That's, I'll get you. I'll, I'll give you something. So you can run Windows executables from WSL if you add the extension. If I went and I said Explorer, it wouldn't do anything. If I run explorer.exe, the dot is required for the current folder. I'm going to end up here, and you'll notice that I'm in the WSL local host network. And now I can see right there, look, Azure Friday PFX, so the Windows certificate sitting here in WSL. I can then copy it into OneDrive. Then I switch over to PowerShell, and then I can say import WSL, import PFX cert, and then I can say export PFX cert. So I would go like this. And then if we switch over into Azure real quick. Da, da, da. Azure Friday. Boop, boop, boop. Go into certs. Bring your own certs, baby. Right there. Boop. You can see here. Check it out. That's the one that I noticed is expiring today. That's the one that expired from last year. And here's the one that I just updated earlier. So then I can click on custom domains. And before, right here, it says solution. It said update binding. And I was just able to go and update that binding. So now I don't have to think about that. So then the next step is to take that little bit of three lines of, uh, of bash script and automate it and figure out maybe I automated from an Azure function. Maybe I put it in a script somewhere. So every three months, this will go and update. There are already Azure Let's Encrypt solutions, including one that I wrote up in 2018. But I find them really challenging because they require service principles and client secrets in Azure storage. And it's just a lot of dancing for something that happens every little bit. In the future, what I really want to do is go to certificates and click on manage certificates, which you get for free, right? So I want to go here, pick these and say, add app service manage certificate. And that'll use DigiSearch and it'll get it for me. The reason that I'm being extra paranoid and why I found it to be challenging was not only because it is Azure, has Azure in the name, but I wanted the Apex domain and www. And in doing that, I usually end up getting a star dot or a wildcard cert. And that got me to this point. So that should work both ways. There you go. So then the next step would be to canonicalize that and do a redirect. So both of those domains don't work. And I pick one. So I need to pick. So we go to like www.hanselman.com or we just go to hanselman.com. We end up on www every time because I've picked one. I've canonicalized my, my URL. And that actually reminds me, I should check my cert here as well. So I have until November on this one. So that's a yearly assert that I actually buy. 
But I thought that the interaction between Ubuntu and Windows really kind of like showcased how nice it is right now and how if I go somewhere and I happen to see instructions on how to do something on Linux, I'm like, cool, I'll just do it on Linux. So for example, uh, you see, I have the same prompt with my blood sugar in both places, but I've also gone and set up GH, which is a really great GitHub CLI. Does anyone use the GitHub CLI rather than using Git? This is great. Check this out. So let's go to GitHub. And I'm going to say GH clone. I'm going to grab some Windows terminal shaders. Let me actually rename that folder so I can do this again with y'all. This is me being super old. Anyone want to comment on why I just did that? Anyone see the, dig into the psychology of what just happened here. This is a, a moment where my demographic becomes clear. What happened here? I was in PowerShell. I dropped into fake DOS. I renamed a folder and then I swapped back out. Why did I do that? Any thoughts, comments, questions? Because I don't know how to rename a folder in PowerShell, but I knew how to do it in DOS. And I know that that's a failing of mine. I also don't know how to delete a folder. Like if you go rd slash s in the name of a folder, I know that that removes a directory and subdirectories. Notice that I so very much know not how to do that in PowerShell that I will shell out to DOS and pass the command in in order to prevent myself learning how to do that in PowerShell. So that's a personal failing. I feel bad about that. So now I'm going to go into this Windows Terminal Shaders folder. Let me go into the old, not the old one, but the new one. Oh, did I not? Oh, I actually never cloned it. GH repo clone. Now GH is great because you can go GH auth login, get to the GitHub, and it'll tell you which GitHub you want to log into. You hit enter. It'll actually pop up a web browser. Isn't that cool? And then you can give it your code. It'll authorize the CLI, set up all your Git repositories and stuff. You can see I've got multi-factor, all the factors, auth. And then I'll go ahead and do that. I'm just re re-authenticating right now, so it's not a huge deal. Okay, I'm all set. Come back out here. You can see, look, it sets up your Git protocol, logs you in, sets everything up. So I always use GitHub CLI. I believe it is uh, github.cli on WinGet. It's not a replacement for Git, but it is a, a plugin basically on Windows that is gonna enable you to do other stuff. So I can type things like uh, gh issue list, and I can see open issues from the command line on a GitHub repository. So if we switched back over to Hansel Minutes and I did gh issue list, let's say closed issues. Is it closed? Oh man, this sucks. You know how when your favorite CLI has a thing that you use all the time, but then they changed it? So apparently they have changed the flag. I wanted to see closed issues. Filter by state. So now it's dash S closed. That's lame. Dash S equals colon. Come on, people. Does it not come on? What's going on here? Dash S, state, filter by state. Oh, GitHub issue list. There we go. So there's me doing test issues on my own repository, right? And then I can go and say issue, um, what was that, like 220 um, status, issue status. No issues assigned, no issues mentioning me. I think I can go issue view 220. Yeah, see, so I opened and closed an issue two years ago. So I find that really cool, being able to run around and do that. And of course, with the addition of this menu, which allows me to also go like that, I find running around the command line a lot more friendly. Now I'm in here at um, Windows terminal shaders, which are fun. Let's go and say settings, and then I'm gonna hit open JSON file from inside of Windows Terminal. 
And then let's see if we have any terminal shaders. I'm gonna switch back over here to, to the browser. Windows, shaders, terminal. And the name of the configuration, shaders. Where's the shaders? I never remember the um, experimental pixel shader path. Okay, so experimental pixel shader path. So we're inside of settings and we'll go into, what are we on? PowerShell, 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 PowerShell. Here we go, comma, experimental pixel shader path. I'm gonna go back over to my command line where I was in the folder. I'm gonna say, instead of, cause I'm in Windows, I'm gonna type start dot instead of explore. That's gonna get me here. Now I'm gonna shift right click and say copy as path. So I got that to appear. If I right click, copy as path wouldn't appear. If I right click, it's not there. Oh shit, they added it. Excuse my French. I forgot, this is Windows 11. They, I, so I had been typing shift um, right click shift for so many years. And I'm talking about Windows 7. They finally added it as a top level thing. So it's control shift C. So you know how you click on a thing and you hit control C? Control shift C, I've just copied it into the current path. Switch back over here, go like this. So I just copied the path, that's convenient. Double up on the backspaces because reasons. You with me? Now we're cooking. Yeah, baby. Notice the scan line going by. Just want to call that out because it's awesome. Here it comes. Oh, yeah. Now, if there's anyone on the call who's less than 35, I want to apologize ahead of time that this is a, you know, a bunch of old people uh, that are excited about that. Robert says, why? Because it's awesome for no other reason than you can. And just to point out how incredibly insane this is, to Robert's point, I'm gonna hit F4. I'm gonna go down here, look at some of the other options that we have available to us, including green two, and then I'm gonna save that. Did green two work? Come on, man, people are watching. There it is. Look at that. So what's cool about this isn't the fact that I can make it look old. What's cool about it is that these are literally shaders. So let's see what the options are. So if we go back over into our folder here, let's pick something that's a little bit more interesting. That's kind of insane. So maybe not do that. Uh, there was one that um, Kayla liked that was called Neon Road. There you go. So that's literally a 3D shader that you would use in a video game. And what that means is you can do whatever you want. It's just a reminder that the Windows terminal is a DirectX app. And you can do whatever you want. This is actually running on the GPU right now. It's not slowing my machine down. It's just awesome. So if we can go over here to my GPU, you can see that it's all happening on the GPU. It's hardware accelerated. And it's just cool. And these are all just HLSL files of which you can go and explore. Scott, you're muted. I think he hit mute. That means you, Hanselman, you're muted. Yeah, you're still muted on Zoom. Okay, I didn't mute myself, so somebody must there have right-clicked and muted everybody. So someone has power they shouldn't have. Watch out for that. When did you lose me all? 
about five seconds ago. Okay, cool. All right. So I was pointing out that these HLSL files that you're running around in here are really just C code. They're actually being dynamically compiled. So you can go and float around and read about how they did this. This is not a lot of code. So the curves, the overscan, the blur, it's all just math. So it's a really fun way to learn about these shaders. And there's a ton of these shaders that you can play with. Uh, and it's worth uh, worth checking out. It's nothing. It's not just the, the retro stuff, which is fun, but like I just wanted to call out that it's neat. And again, why? Why not? No reason, because it's awesome. All right, let's go back over here. Now, a lot of people don't like the command line, and that's fine. I enjoy it because I like to drive stick shift, and it kind of like gets me closer to the road. Um, and I feel like you've been able to see me move around pretty quickly. I feel like I'm whipping around in, in uh, the command line pretty fast. Uh, a lot of people feel like focusing too much on the command line can be a little gatekeepy. And I think that's something that we want to watch out for as we are some of us of a certain age. Uh, there are people who like to click and that's okay. And we should support them. But I also think that there's value in being able to switch between driving automatic and driving stick. Uh, as long as we're doing it in a way that is including everybody and making sure that people feel comfortable, like, uh, you know, because if, if you like to drive a stick, that's cool. If you don't like to drive a stick, that's cool too. That makes sense. I think that's an important thing to point out because the uh, the argument that, that maybe the Linux people of old would have said is you're not a real dev unless you, you know, run around at the command line is probably not uh, the, the the move that we want to we want to show. Okay. Um, any people think that the uh, command line is needs to be put to bed and uh, we need to get off the command line completely? No one has that feeling? So you guys all feel like you can switch back and forth, use the ones that make you happy and use the ones that don't? Good. That's, be, that's really cool because I like the fact that I'm inside of Visual Studio Code and then I can go like this and be at the command line. And what's significant about this is I can actually be at my command line. So all of those changes that I made here in my command line, including all those extensions appear within VS Code itself. And that's really cool. Now I can go over into Visual Studio Senior and open up the terminal as well. You can see here, I've got developer PowerShell and developer command prompt, and there's actually code from Windows Terminal that's gonna allow me to do that. Now let's point out something though, what's going on here? Where'd my cool icons go, right? fonts. Jeremy's right, fonts. It's all about the fonts. Now, this is where I think Visual Studio kind of drops uh, in um, awesomeness a little bit, is that now to go into the beast and go hunting for terminal. And I need to change it to freaking Cascadia something something. I thought it was Cascadia how do I spell mine? Cascadia code. I have a special font that I use. Let's go and see what it is. Appearance, PowerShell, appearance, Cascadia, C-A-S-K. That's the custom font that I have that has all these glyphs. So then I got to pull it out of here but I'm not seeing it. Are you? I am not. No, I don't see it. Was it, um, did it have to be installed with Windows? No, it might have been that it's not installed like for the entire universe. You know what I mean? Like it needs to be installed for, or it's, it might that it might be, it might be that it's not a true type font. Maybe I installed what are called open fonts. So if I go over here to Windows fonts, we can see where dark mode ends. Dark mode is really just an opinion at this point. Um, these are the fonts. Yeah, so I think the issue is that these are open type fonts and not true type fonts. So I would probably need to go and find the true type version of that. This is a guess right now. Like this talk is being completely made up right now. So if I go to nerd fonts, and then Hanselman came to was not prepared. I don't know what was going on. Super unprofessional. Um, Cascadia code. The disclaimer was in the title. 
unplug. Can we warn them that there was nothing useful in this talk and they should lower their expectations? Because no, I want to make sure that everyone the gets their money's worth. Because I know people are paying zero dollars to be here. Here we go. Maybe so you here's should add unleashed to the title, Sean. Is that unleashed? If I've been unleashed uh, at this point? Un unplugged, unleashed. That's <laughs> awesome. Unhinged. Completely useless. Oh, Not his team says unstable. Unst I'm unstable. Yeah, I'll, unstable. I'll unstable video signal. That's not me. I'll tell you that. I will never ever be unstable when it comes to video. Are you able to see me? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. He was just making the the title comparison on Teams. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right. So I'm installing True Type fonts in a, a weak attempt to fix this bug and assume that I'm right and we have a reason. Because if this doesn't work, then who knows what it is going to be? But it's fun though, isn't it? Okay, close that, close that, open Visual Studio, open Visual Studio, here it comes on another window, now it's going to open up here, tools, options, dark mode is a lie, fonts, text editor, terminal, open it up, there it is, so now we know that we don't support open type fonts, we open to something else, so let's go and pick Cascadia code, whatever, and make it a skosh bigger. So now we fixed our issue and now it's just a matter of the color sucking because I've got a weird theme. But you see what happened there, right? That's how the Hanselman yep. brain works. Rob, including good stuff. Oh, I also wanna point out my theme here. There's a number of themes. There's uh, dark, light, blue, and Beyonce. And uh, Beyonce, uh, you can get at yonsetheme.com. Yonsetheme.com. This is done by uh, Mina Markham. Uh, she's got one for Bash, uh, one for Visual Studio Code. I did the one for Visual Studio. And I also added a theme for Windows Terminal. And you can get all of these if you like Beyonce at the uh, at the GitHub. So that's why my um, my fonts are completely unhinged and pink. So enjoy that. All right, customize your space, friends. Why is there still a light theme? Inclusion. Everybody wants something different from their computer. It's good. It's good to have different choices, right? Why are my fonts so big? Because I'm blind. Because reasons. There's always a good reason. This is the code here for Hansel Minutes, my uh, podcast that you should all listen to. Uh, and one of the things that I can do when you see something that's completely unhinged, like this function here called Get Sponsors for Show, this is a very David Fowler function, a funk of task of list of sponsors, funk of funk of T. And you don't know what's going on here. So you select that code and then you come down here and you say chat. And you say explain this code. Isn't that cool? I think a lot of people right now are focusing on AI from a generative perspective, which has some concerns and is somewhat problematic. Um, but from a summarization perspective, I think that's where people are sleeping on it. The TLDR feature of AI is as useful or more so to me than the uh, the generating. You know, like I'm glad that ChatGPT can generate a limerick in the form of whatever, you know, like fine. Uh, but being able to go and say, what am I looking at? What's happening here is super useful. Now this is inside of Visual Studio Code, but I've also got Visual Studio Preview. So I can go and open up the, uh, the Hanselman website, which is the brochureware website. Um, and you know, Visual Studio, Code, Visual Studio still has some cool features. Actually, I just recently noticed this one. Notice the line numbers up here as I start to scroll down, watch this. You see what just happened there? I love that. Isn't that great? I just wanna pause there and make sure people absorb what's happening there. Yeah, you don't have to chase all the dashed lines uh, so much anymore. It, right, uh, so it's, gives you keeping, that sandwich. it's keeping context there and telling me where I am. So if I go down here, 
I'm in the configure method, but I don't need to remember this. So it's this little tiny bit of context that makes my life a little bit easier. And then I can right click, ask Copilot, explain this. You know, with uh, the Copilot chat explain type things, this is, I can see this heavily being used if you hire a new person yep. and they're digging through existing code, legacy code type stuff, and it can help explain yep. uh, a lot of that and help get them up to speed better. Now, Rob uh, Richardson just said to uh, turn on the setting. So let's do that for sticky scroll for VS Code. Sticky scroll folding provider. Is that the one, Rob? Because you sent me a YouTube and that's what young people do. I'm not watching a video in order to learn how to do something. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's the checkbox at the very top. Let me go check. No, that one's already on. I'm going to guess that it's folding provider. But I don't know. Let's go see. We were inside of startup. Yeah, I don't. So I think the issue isn't a setting. I think the issue is there is that not next one, one down. for next, the next checkbox down. Indentation model? No, no, no. The, um, oh, right there. Turning it on. The actual do it button. Yeah, sorry. Brain fart. No worries. There it is. Luscious. Interesting. This is another Love little that. subtle difference between. Notice how they don't include the namespace. This is one of the things that I have mixed feelings about between Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code is here's an example where one thing is written in one way and used in one editor and one's written in another way and used in another editor. So the folding provider model does not include the namespace. Is that a bad thing? I don't know. But better than nothing. Thank you for that tip, Rob. And I also point out the Visual Studio pets that are chilling down here. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. That's when you have so much CPU that you just want to, <laughs> you're like, you know, Windows Defender is not using enough of my CPU. I'm going to go ahead and just have the pets spend as much possible time as they can just beating the crap out of this computer. This is my new computer that Damien Edwards built for me. I'm very happy with it. 24 cores, 32 logical processors, 128 gigs of RAM. It can run Crisis. Last thing I'll show you, and we can do a little more Q&A, is if we go over to Hansel Minutes, the podcast, notice that I've got these Docker build PS1. I've got both, you know how you do cat, which means concatenate. I also use bat. Bat is like a better cat, and it'll color and put lines and do syntax highlighting. So if you're like at the command line and you wanna see some code, Let's try the, uh, try uh, any CS file here. What do we got in this folder? Let's do a Azure pipelines. So that's a nice way to be able to see a file. So bat is better cat. Okay, so going back to the Docker build, I wanna point this out. It's a .ps1 file. This is called a shebang or a hash bang, like Ricky Martin. And that says, go and use the environments posh the PowerShell in the environment. And what that means is if I have PowerShell installed on the Linux side, it will know that that's a PowerShell file. So that means I can write one file as long as I have the shebang there. And that means that those scripts will run in both places. I can run those scripts in Windows and Linux. So here I'm gonna run my Docker build script inside of Windows, and I'm gonna go and build this. You'll notice that I'm using Docker inside of uh, Windows. But if I switch over to Ubuntu and I type Docker images, you can see I built podcasts five days ago. Let's go over here. And while this is building, let's do a split screen. So we're doing a restore. So it hasn't been restored in a while. Once these layers are done, though, the layers won't end up... Uh, happening again. That's the great thing about Docker layers. Each one of these will be cached and it'll be faster and faster each time. Usually I get throttled, not by my internet. This is only going at 30 megabits a second, but I end up getting throttled by Docker itself. 
So you can see here that the Docker desktop backend is at six. There you go. Now it's a hundred megabits. So now some now it hit another. There you go. Hit another um, backend that wasn't so slow. So it's actually doing the build inside of Docker, and this is cool. So if we go back over here and we open up the Docker file, you can see that's a multi-stage build using .NET six. So the first level is building the source, builds inside the container. Then this is new. I don't think I've blogged about this yet, but I actually install Playwright headless inside of the build Docker container, then run unit tests. Now I've modified the unit tests in my, uh, my podcast. I'm going to make your pets go away now. And you notice, by the way, I'm not, I'm, I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code with the new Visual Studio Dev Kit. So you can see I have a full solution explorer and um, refactoring in here. So I've got Playwright tests. Where are my Playwright tests? Playwright tests. This is interesting. I wonder why they're not appearing in this list right here. I'm wondering out loud if maybe I, um, didn't load them. Hey, buddy, what's up? You okay? I'll be done in a few minutes. Oh, thank you. So I made a web server factory that boots up the podcast website inside, in the, in the memory process of NUnit. You all with me so far? So I fire up that, and then I go looking for the port that it's running on. So check this out. We get the full URL. We find a free TCP IP port. We spin it up inside the test, fire up the tests, then run playwright tests inside of NUnit. So I can go and say, click on the search button. Is the card visible? So I'm literally headlessly, we go to Hansel minutes, go to episodes, and I type in like wife. You see how, as I type, it's filtering in real time. So it's running JavaScript on the client side and loaded the entire episode from the server side. You can see here, it says type async wife. And then it confirms that she's been on the show five times. All of that running within Docker. Isn't that cool? Now I go over here in Ubuntu, and you can see the podcast one was made two minutes ago. There's a lot going on there, but I want to just showcase how seamlessly I'm moving between Docker and Windows and Linux. It's very comfortable. And then all of this is now running if we switch over into the Azure portal. Go back over here. Azure Friday, Hansel Minutes, Hanselman.com, and the blog all running in a single app service P1 on Linux in containers. So I'm very proud of that. And I wanna showcase, if you go to hanselminutes.com, go to the very bottom, check this out. The current runtime version of .NET, the commit that's currently live right now, and the build logs which allows me to then right click. And I say open link as work because that's where my uh, profiles are. I run a personal and a, and a work. So I'm gonna right click on that open link as work. And we'll see that the last version of the same site was done two weeks ago and I updated in unit to version 4.4. And then if I right click on the build, I go directly and log into Azure DevOps. I still use Azure DevOps because it's awesome and click on jobs, look at this. I can see the tests ran and passed and will fail the build. We're going down here to playwright test. You can actually see the playwright test running. I've got 19 tests all running in Azure DevOps happily. Isn't that hot? I know I went really fast, but questions, comments, thoughts, opinions. When will Ubuntu be on the outside and Win32 on the inside? Never. Um, have you run it on .NET 8 yet? Yes, it works just fine. I need to switch to .NET 8. I'm going to go LTS to LTS. 
Yeah, Steve, let me just talk to Steve Elliott here. Look how easy these are to write. Not only this, Playwright includes a recorder. So you can just record the tests and as you click, it'll generate the code for you. And then you just rearrange it and tidy up. Now, I haven't done this in a while, but let me actually try. Let's go back out of Ubuntu. I usually run all my tests headlessly, which is not awesome. Um, let's go over here and let's go and let's type .NET test. This might work. It might not. But then again, this talk is garbage, so it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so I'm writing .NET test. So I'm not running the build and the test inside of uh, Windows. Okay, cool. So it's going to fail. And that's because it looks like I don't actually have Playwright on this machine. Isn't that interesting? So here... Playwright has put Playwright into a current uh, a Playwright installer in a folder. This is a, a little weird Playwrightism that I have I have kind of some feelings about. But what Playwright is, remember, Playwright is not a .NET thing. So the way that they set themselves up is down here in debug. What's it? Deep into the beast. If Playwright's not there, they drop a Playwright.ps1 file here. And what they want you to do is run. Playwright install. And what they do is they download Chrome and Chromium and Edge and uh, Firefox uh, and put them in app data local. So local to your machine right here. See? They're loading just little tiny local versions of the browsers for Playwright. Uh, yes, yeah, some people feel, Alex, that Playwright is better than Cypress. I think it's a bit of a religious argument. I think we can argue that Playwright is better than Selenium, uh, definitely. Uh, the Playwright versus Cypress is kind of a Betamax versus VHS. But yeah, Playwright is very, very well thought of, and I am enjoying it very much. A good person to talk to about Playwright would be Debbie O'Brien. Debbie O'Brien on, uh, on the bird site. Rob's got a good opinion there as well. Cypress is node only, looks like. Cool. So, so I've done that. So now Playwright's installed. Let's go back uh, and see if we can actually do this. So I'm running unit tests, integration tests, and Playwright tests all at the same time. So there's my unit tests. Now, one of the things that's hard about these, this haunt of Cypress and uh, Playwright in general is the how do you know it's working? How do you know anything is happening at all? Uh, usually these are meant to run headlessly. And I, I tend to forget. So those, those ran and you didn't see anything. Okay. So this is where I have to remember or Google for the, the head, is it headed, headed, headed playwright environment variable? Headed debug? I want to run it in a non-headless mode. This seems like the kind of thing I would have thought about before. Yes, I did. I wrote headed tests.ps1. I was just trying to remember how I did this. Because I Googled for it once, I don't want to ever Google for it again. So I set this environment headed, which is weird. I would have called it headless. And then I'll say .NET test. Now I have three monitors here. So my guess is the mon what's gonna happen is it's gonna pop up on one of these monitors. There it is, run it over here. So I just ran it over here. So that's hands up in the air. It's clicking around, see? Do you see that? So it's click, clicky. Now, when you get that working, let me tell you, that is really satisfying. Because you you go and you run these smoke tests all the time. It's such a hassle. Look how freaking easy this is, kids. Like, look, here's a here's a good here's a simple example. Does the website have the correct title? Now, what's cool is that you use the the you end unit or whatever you already use. Now it doesn't technically support X unit because of some um, asynchrony issues. Um Dev home config Leandro for WSL is not done yet, but it's in the list. Um, so yeah, here I'm just doing a regex. I'm just expecting. So this expectation is a page assertion that I'm using inside of this. It's really straightforward. 
um, testing to see that H1 has my name. Then the only, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably blog about this this week. What's, what's cool about what I did here, is, and that's different philosophically from how Node does things, is with Node, they fire up their own like NPM start. They fire up their own web server. And we don't have a web server lying around. Right, there's no .NET start web server. Kestrel starts because startup runs it, right? So how do you get a how do you run a test in Cypress or in 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 um, in Playwright on npm on Node? You type npm start test. It fires up the web server that's lying around, and everything goes. But .NET.exe is the thing that runs the test here. So I type .NET.exe. It finds tests. And then here in one time setup, which happens once for the tests, I spin up the web server and I pass it startup. And what web test server factory does is it builds up localhost colon whatever port you're on, then tells the host that is firing up ASP.NET, here's the IP address, then pretends to start up a test server and never uses it and then throws it away at the end. And in doing that, we end up spinning up local hosts. We fire up our startup class. And then once we do that, because that has already happened under one-time setup, each of these tests just start going to that URL. So if you look here at the beginning of each method, go to async, go to async, go to async. That's the one thing that sucks about my method is I should be able to figure out a way where it goes to the home page first. So I might want to make a setup that's shared amongst all of the tests and then have it do that one line everywhere. Does that make sense? Then you'd have a bunch of things. So once you have all this set up, and it's not a lot of code here, like look, that's it, right? This is not rocket surgery. Then you can just write tests all day long. It's lovely. Um, Steve, can you expand on what your question is? You can tag HTML elements and not rely on say location. If I don't go to a URL, I will not be on a page. So I got to go somewhere. Then I have to ask questions about the somewhere that I went. But feel free to unmute if you want to say something. Oh, yeah, if a button moves. That's a great point. So this is a good point Steve's making. So this isn't the kind of like go to 100 comma 100 and click. This means find the button with the title this or the element that or the CSS class this. Use whatever locator you want to use. And that's what's cool here. I'm actually looking for any object, a div, anything with the ID top bar, which is great. And I'm saying I just want anything with the ARIA role link. That doesn't mean that it's an anchor. It doesn't mean that it's anything. It could be anything, as long as a screen reader thinks it's a link. And then I click on it if it has the name episodes. So that clicks on that link right there. Isn't that cool? Now, the only thing that sucks about this, the, the fatal flaw about my technique is I start with the .NET SDK, which is a Linux container with a .NET SDK. I build it. The .NET SDK doesn't include Playwright, so I have to pay the price every build to get Playwright. Now, I could change my layering so that I run Playwright install earlier so it gets cached, but the problem is this play that playwright.ps1 file that I showed you that bootstrapped playwright doesn't show up until a build. So there's a chicken and the egg situation. I need to build it. The source code changes often. So unfortunately, playwright gets lower in the caching uh, layers. So when I do run tests, I pay the price for that. I think that there's a chicken and the egg issue here. I need to basically have, I want a .NET 6 Docker layer with Playwright pre-installed. Now here's the problem. Playwright does include a Docker container with Playwright and .NET. However, it's non-versioned. So I can't guarantee what version it is because there's a Cartesian product there. The version of .NET and the cross product with the version of Playwright. So 
I, I pay a little, I pay a couple hundred megs every time I run that. Not awesome, but it is what it is. The clean part is though, then I switch layers and I make a publish one and I copy the results to out, which gives me a nice, clean, small runtime only container, which includes no compilers or anything. And if I wanted to go one step further, I could do tree trimming or with .NET 8, I could do AOT and have a really, really small um, container. So I'm proud of that. All right. In the same way that you did that for the publish step, you can do that for the playwright step. Rather than driving from build, hmm. drive from .NET slash ASP.NET. Okay, so you're saying do this once on and then 29. copy it out? Yep. Yeah. Copy the built resource. Let's talk about that because I want to I learn yeah. how to do that better. So yeah, ping me offline, Rob. Sweet. Yeah, let's definitely do that offline. That'd be fun. Maybe we can do a YouTube or something. And then the H1, I search for an H1 because it's just the first one. So these are, but the point with the locator is it's link. So you can go the first one, you can go the second one, you can go by ID. Some of these tests will be more robust than others, but they are mine. So that's a valid point. Cool, good questions, friends. Um, getting late over here. Any questions or thoughts, comments? This was awesome. Is this helpful? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fun. Like, I have used some uses for everything that you just showed. <laughs> Good. Good. Cool. I yeah, had one else question. Have any... about, Go ahead, Randy. Uh, what were you using for the Oh My Posh equivalent in your, w in your WSL? I was using Oh My Posh which in fact now supports everything. Great question. I did not know that. Thank you. Yeah. So the Oh My Posh has been rewritten in Go. Uh, oh My Posh. And uh, if you actually go over to my YouTube, you can find me and Jan who wrote Oh My Posh live code my blood sugar segment and include it in Oh My Posh. So if you go over here to segments, Night Scout is the open source system for blood sugar. And it's now built in to Oh My Posh. And we built it live on YouTube in an hour and a half using um, Go and dev containers. There is no better open source project to learn how dev containers work than Oh My Posh. It's extraordinary. And if you go down here to docs and installation, it works on Linux. It's built into Homebrew. And Homebrew now works on WSL. So if you're not familiar with Homebrew, you can search for Linux Brew homebrew on Linux, which is made specifically for WSL. I like them apples. That's very that's very cool. I, I would swear that the Mac and Linux stuff were not there when I last looked at Oh My Posh. So thank I would you. take that bet. But it'd been about two years ago, I think. Yeah, I think that's about when I set it up. And I really I haven't missed it by look. that much. Yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Randy. Cool. Yep. And what's nice about that is I can share uh, the uh, the segments and stuff between them. So you notice if I go over here and I go .NET build, I'm on Linux. I'm building the tests and everything. It works just fine. And then having the having the same layout, you know, it's it's just very comforting. Cool. Fun. Yeah. So, I noticed the, you're using power toys. Oh, I yeah, I have power toys, but I didn't really talk about it a lot. Um, I just noticed the uh, the double control, the mouse. Oh yeah, I mean, power There's toys is ever present in my life. Actually, I could do a whole other hour and a half on power toys. Yeah, it's power toys is, uh, is our is our pl power toys is our playground. So over in power toys, you've got like. Who's locking that file? Editing the host file. There's an image resizer now. Mouses without borders is now built in. So you can use your mouse and move between two computers with the identical mouse, which is creepy. Here's the real money. Paste as plain text. Yes. And then uh, registry preview. And then another one is really good that might be worth showing you all is uh, Peak. 
So this one's kind of cool. Let's switch over to do 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 do. So I'm going to hit Alt Space, Alt Space, GitHub, okay. Enter. So you saw how I moved around there much faster. Now I can click on a YAML file and hit Control Space, and it'll it'll pop up a peak tool. So here's a, a JSON file. Now it's popping up on my center monitor, which is probably a bug. Uh, here's an XML file, control space. You see? And I think I've got some, let me see if I can find, here's my Hansel Minutes production app, control space. And you see, here you go, there's all my posh right there. It'll show, a, it'll instantly pop up and then it'll have an open in, open in whatever uh, app. So like here's a Word document that doesn't have a previewer. Oh, and I'll give you a, a preview of who's gonna be on the next episode of Hansel Minutes. This is the guy that invented ethernet. What? Turing award winner and the founder of 3Com. So it's like the fourth billionaire that I've talked to. That Super nice fella. Awesome. Yeah, that's episode 900, kids. Awesome. You got to throw a big party when you get to a thousand, aren't you? Yeah, a thousand is going to be interesting. I think I'll just retire. Just call it. I'll, I'll retire at 1,024. I think we'll just <laughs> call it a day. You see the question about zooming around? Oh, what am I using to zoom around? I'm using Zoomit. And uh, a lot of people use Zoomit in a very kind of basic way, and that's fine. Uh, but Zoomit has some functionality and some features that it's pretty, pretty neat that's worth um, calling out. So let me, for example, I'll switch over into like something. Here's the Windows Store. It's to rant, put something on the screen. So when you hit Windows, when you hit Control-1, it does a freeze frame and a zoom in. So what you're looking at here is a screenshot. So right now, this is not a screenshot. Control one, I'm zoomed in on a screenshot. It is no longer updating in real time. Does that make sense? Like store could have crashed, but you wouldn't know because I'm on a screenshot. Then I click once with the left mouse. I can draw, I can type G for green, Y for yellow and B for blue, okay? I can hit shift control, click and pull away. Click and pull away, click and pull away, click and pull away. I can hit control alt and drag. When I hit escape, it goes away. Now I hit R for red, shift control pull away, but I'm holding down shift and control and I'm gonna use the mouse wheel. Make sense? The other thing you can do is you can hit control F, control four, and now it is a live update and zoomed in, similar to Windows Magnifier. Or I can hit Windows five, it's control five rather, and it's actually gonna record the screen and now we'll save it. So control five will do a, screen record with zoom it so i recommend zoom it as a real exercise in learning how to do this stuff and then the last one is control six which is snipping tool built into zoom it i know that's built into uh windows itself but now it's built into zoom it also works with 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 uh, pens Mark, Mark and I uh, talk regularly about Zoomit and all of those improvements are, hey, Mark, this would be cool if it did that. And then he runs off and does it. And it's all one C file. It's one giant 5,000 line C file. And if you look at our talk at Ignite last year, um, we did a whole talk where we found bugs and fixed bugs live on stage in Zoomit. 
Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was interesting. It was real, all live. No, no lies, no fake. I don't fake stuff. Cool. Wow, that was awesome. All right, I'm any glad. questions? Yes, yeah, zoom in for the Mac, please. Uh, I'm excited that because uh, I haven't looked at Oh My Posh in quite a while, and I've been on a Mac, and now it's available there. So I'm going to be doing that tonight or tomorrow as well. Get that Good. installed. The most important thing about Oh My Posh is finding a theme that makes you happy and then customizing your segments. And the segments can be a little confusing. So expect a yep. burst of, oh, that's cool. And then a lot of like, I don't know what the heck's going on as you edit and learn about segments. But you can have segments come and go depending on whether or not they belong there. Like you saw how I only see the Git segment when I'm in a Git folder. And I only see right. the .NET segment. So you can do .NET segments, Node, Python, whatever, and they'll turn on and off uh, as they like. Um, and then you'll want to initially put your, your Oh My Posh configuration file in your OneDrive or your Dropbox, but then right-click on it in OneDrive and mark it as always offline so that you don't pay the price for OneDrive syncing uh, on that particular one. There you go. Kubernetes segment. Love it. Uh, the font issue, Santosh, is always uh, nerd fonts. Go to nerdfonts.com, get your favorite font plus the glyphs, or search for nerd fonts in Hanselman, and I have a whole blog about how to build your own custom font with just the segments that you want. Jeremy says the peak bug is fixed. I have not played with Text Extractor. That one is awesome. I will tell you that's, I use that a lot. Um, so if I have like um, an image that has text on it and I don't feel like oh, yeah. typing it out, that is OCR. Not to be that guy, but that's built into iPhone. So I oh. just, uh, when you open up an iPhone <laughs> photo, you just select the text and it comes right off it. Same on the Google. On, on the, the Google, Google photos. The Google, the Google photos. <laughs> The technique that I found really helpful with uh, Oh My Posh segments is find the theme that you like, copy it into a new file, run yep. that theme, and then compare that with themes that have interesting elements that you like, copy and paste that into the theme that you just built, and start to futz with it. So that then when you screw it up, you have the original to go back to, and when you install the next version of Oh My Posh, you don't blow away your custom theme. Dig it. And then be ready to answer all the questions as you present about, where'd you get that cool theme? <laughs> or just have that one of the segments is the uh, the link. To Hanselman's blog. <laughs> yeah. Let's put everyone to Hanselman. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. How did you get that explain feature in Copilot? I can't get it to work. Um, are you logged into Copilot? Does any yeah. other part of Copilot work? Yes. Are I can go from chat. Chat. Both in VS Code and in Visual Studio. So, I, so make sure that your scope is correct. So I'm using Copilot nightly. I select the code and then I say explain. If it, it uh, the early versions of Copilot don't have a concept of this because they think you mean the keyword this. So try saying, explain this method or, you know, what does this file do or stuff like that. What I was doing was selecting it. Copilot only gets the context of the selected text along with limited context of the open tabs. It doesn't have access to all your code. Oh, so I have to be on the beta to get that chat window up? Is that what? You have to oh, be you don't on... have, the... yeah, you got to be on the Copilot chat. You have to be on the Copilot oh. chat, which is called Copilot X. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was there uh, at Build, and uh, right in the middle, in the fifth row back. And when you guys were getting started, you and Mark, and you had your head peeking around the wall and uh, kind of going up and down like your heads were just floating. That was uh, that was hilarious as well. And I got to see you doing that, uh, your Asteroids game. I'm glad. That's online yeah. as well if you search for Mark and Scott Learn to Code. Yes, and I highly recommend you do it. That is an awesome video. Yeah, I felt pretty good about that one. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to go make dinner. Does Copilot X work on VSC? 
VSC. What is VSC? VS Code. Yes, it is non-denominational. There are extensions right. for Copilot chat on both VS and VS Code. And the, the one that you would use on Visual Studio would be Copilot Nightly. And it works and works really well. It's pretty good. I get a head scratcher. Okay. How do I hide the date and time in Windows 11 so that my presentations are timeless? You get on Insiders and you get on Insiders Dev and that feature exists and it will be available this fall. Or you get one of the half dozen apps that will cover that up by floating a window above it. Yeah, the float a window above it is cute and all, but I'm no, like- I know it's I not good. I'm telling you, I was the number one person in line to say that was dumb. <laughs> but they've added not only the ability to hide that, but also the ability to uh, add seconds for those who want that. For an OPS, you could just drag that part of the screen off the edge of the recording. Yeah, but there's a certain amount of realism by showing the start menu and the um, taskbar that you lose if you just crop off that part of the screen. Very true. All right, guys. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.